So welcome families, professionals, and researchers to our first annual SEP BP1 virtual family conference. Yay. I still can't believe Simon's VIP Connect has provided us this unique opportunity to connect, to ask questions to knowledgeable experts in the field of neurodevelopmental disorders, and to learn more about SEP BP1 disorder, which impacts all of our lives in a substantial way. Thank you, Dr. Wendy Chung and by Simon's VIP for acknowledging the challenges our community faces. Sorry, Wendy, if you were speaking up. <laughs> and, and adding our gene to your list of genes you research and focus on. And also thank you, Dr. Wendy Chung, for collecting, organizing, and taking the time to present your findings to our community today. And thanks, Lindsay Kartner and Caitlin Singer for all your help and for taking care of the communications and logistics for this conference. And thank you, Dr. Siddharth Srivastava, hope I said that last part right, AKA Dr. Sid, for being the specialist to step forward and to commit to researching our disorder in detail and to have the desire to become the expert for that BP1 disorder. And we appreciate you taking the time to share with us your presentation today on developmental medicine that we'll get to hear. And lastly, thank you to all the families that are on the call with us today. So I mentioned earlier that I'm the president for SEPDP1 Society, which is our nonprofit dedicated to SEPDP1 disorder. Our mission is to provide support to individuals with SEPDP1 disorder and their families to promote discussion and fund research, and to bring awareness and education to the public. We believe our organization will bring targeted treatments to individuals impacted by SEP BP1 disorder by focusing on our mission. As an organization, our idea of targeted treatments include proven or customized teaching methods, programs, and or therapies that help our children learn more effectively medications that are crafted for individuals with that BP1 disorder, and one day a treatment that permanently removes the barriers that that BP1 disorder creates for our children. So we wanted to share some highlights from 2017. We supported a growing community on Facebook, which started out with three at the beginning of the year and grew to 23. And thanks to Jean-Francois and his family for getting that started originally. We formed our nonprofit, including our board and medical and scientific advisory board. And we raised over $12,000 to put towards research for SEP BP1 disorder. We helped move research forward by connecting with over 50 researchers and biotech companies all over the world and aided in the initiation and expansion of our community involvement with Simon's VIP. And although I don't see that we highlighted it here, we have two doctors specializing in SEP BP1 disorder. So in addition to Dr. Sid at Boston Children, we also have Dr. Bregye Van Bon at Radboud Medical Center in the Netherlands. So for 2018, um, our focus will be to fund our first research projects. The projects will be number one, to create a biological model of SEP BP1 disorder to help us understand the affected neural pathways and the molecular and cellular impact of SEP BP1 disorder. Now this biological model could be a mouse model or it could be a human IPSC model. IPSC stands for induced pluripotent stem cells. And IPSCs are derived from skin or blood cells that can become practically any type of human cell. And they can serve as an important tool for modeling and investigating human diseases, as well as for screening drugs. So similar to how an animal model would help us. The second project is to develop a diagnostic journey of SEP BP1 disorder guide. And that'll help us to further understand the direct impact of SEP BP1 disorder on the families and the individuals themselves. And then how will we fund these projects? So we aim to fund them through funds we've raised in 2017 and through our upcoming Rare Carousel of Possible Dreams fundraiser. 
And our goal is for this new fundraiser that we're launching will be 25000 And the combination of those funds will go towards these two research projects. So 2018 is the year for hope. Be the hope, be the change. And I'm more than, more than happy to talk more about our plans or about SEPBP1 Society in general. So if you have questions after the presentations wrap up, we can talk about it more. So thank you. Merci, Eric. Okay, so we'll go ahead and transition here. Um, Lindsay, if you can control the slides, just go to the next slide. Yep. So for the agenda today in terms of what we're doing, this is Wendy Chung. Um, I'm going to be talking about the data that some of you have contributed to the Simons VIP study, and I'll go through also some um, questions that we got ahead of time from the group. So thank you for sending those. And then we'll save a little bit of time for the group to respond if there are questions as I'm going through. If you don't mind, either you can, again, as Lindsay said, chat and send your questions to her in writing as we're going through if you don't want to forget them. Um, but we're going to hold the questions for that question and answer period at the end of that, if that's okay. Um, after that, Dr. Sid is going to go through some, um, what I hope are going to be very practical tips and some things, some questions you may have had about medications for your children and some uh, ways in which those can be effective. And again, at the end of that, we'll save some time for questions. Um, this also, as Lindsay was saying, is going to be recorded. Uh, so the reason we're doing that is that if any families happen to be diagnosed later, we want to make sure this information is immediately accessible to them, as well as if any of your providers, any of your doctors or therapists or anyone else might want to hear about this in the future, they can be able to go on and get this um, at any time in the future. Um, however, this recording part that we're talking about as Lindsay said, we did not record the part at the beginning where we individually identified who you were because we're trying to keep all this information um, not labeling you, so this information is private. And so we're going to actually stop recording at about 4 o'clock when we finish this, but we're going to leave the line open for the families only so that if you all want to talk about anything, anything either that you heard today or just in general, um, be able to talk about your kids or challenges you've had, um, that way you can talk about it and you can talk about it very freely. That's not going to be recorded and we're not going to be on the line listening. So if you want to you know, be able to say anything very private, you can certainly do that. We will end that open line on the call though at five o'clock. So if you still have things you want to talk about afterwards, um, you know, take them to email or, or wherever you guys are talking, um, but we will close the line at five o'clock. Okay, next slide. So um, the Simons VIP program, we actually started several years ago to think about um, different genetic communities where these genes were related to, in some cases, autism, but more broadly, neurodevelopmental disorders. And so we had invited individuals to be able to work with us to understand these conditions better, to be able to serve as a resource where we could learn from each other, as well as to be able to make it easier for researchers to work on these conditions because many researchers might be brilliant, they might have great ideas, but they might not have direct connections to the family. So we wanted to make this easier for them. Um, this is obviously completely voluntary, uh, but for the individuals we have, I'm gonna talk about five individuals that have participated from the community today. And again, none of the information is identifying any one person within this. Um, I will say that it's limited. What I'm going to be able to tell you about today is limited because it's only five individuals, and I don't know that this is representative of the full spectrum of what we see with set bp one and you're also going to see that it's somewhat limited in the age distribution that we're seeing. So individuals, you know, exactly what this is going to evolve into and what the challenges may be for young adults or even older adults, I really don't have that much information so far, but I hope over time more people would be diagnosed and we'll be able to answer those questions. Next slide. So just a very, very brief primer in terms of the genetics. Um, for everyone, at least on the group that I'm talking about today, and it's generally true for the other individuals, at least that I personally know of with set BP1, um, these are things that are encoded within the genes that tend to be, as I'll talk about in a second, new genetic things that were not inherited from either one of the parents. So this is something that we call a spontaneous or a de novo mutation. Um, this condition, as I'll show you in a second, can actually result from either 
uh, a region of the chromosome that contains the gene for set BP1 that's been deleted, um, or it can come because there is one usually single letter alphabet change or a very small number of alphabet changes within the set BP1 gene. Next slide. When we see these, as I said, um, many, <clears throat> most of these are actually new genetic changes in the child. So I'm trying to show that um, in the bottom left with the boy that has sort of the uh, bright rays around him. Uh, we can see this in boys or girls. It just so happens in the series I'm gonna tell you about today, it happens to be boys, um, but there's no reason there should be, a um, girls should be um, protected from this. We can see it in either sex or either gender. Next slide. Um, because these are new or de novo genetic changes, uh, for anyone who might be thinking about having other children, any parents of a child with a set BP1 change, there's a very, very low risk, um, but it's not zero, that it would happen again. So what I mean by that is the genetic change itself could theoretically occur in the egg or the sperm and could be present in additional egg or sperm for those parents. It doesn't happen very often, but that could be the case. So generally we say there's about a 1% chance that it could happen again for a future pregnancy for those parents. For the siblings of a child with set BP1 or more distant relatives, cousins, nieces, nephews, things like that, they really don't have any risk. So we're not, <clears throat> excuse me, we're not really worried about those other relatives. In theory, if an individual with set BP1 were to have children of their own, then there would be a 50-50 risk for that person to pass it on. So that may or may not be an issue for certain individuals, but theoretically that is, um, you know, that's what would happen in terms of them having children in the future. Next slide. So as we're going through this, um, one of the things I wanted to try and clear up in terms of the, um, what could be a confusing point um, is that there is one gene set BP1, but it's associated really with two different conditions. And although there are some similarities between the two conditions, there are some important differences. So there's a condition that was actually described a while ago called Schinzel-Gideon syndrome. And I wanna be clear that is not what I'm talking about today. Um, that condition is again due to changes in set BP1, which I'll show you in a second, but it's due to that gene being overactive or being in overdrive. And we call those gain of function mutations. Now for everyone, I hope on the line today, we're actually talking about the set BP1 condition, which is in, in some ways um, just the opposite in the sense that the set BP1 gene, at least one of the two copies of set BP1 is not working correctly and is actually in many cases not working at all or is what we call a loss of function. So if you wanna think about it, if normally people have 100% of set BP1, uh, Schinzel-Gideon syndrome would be having something like 150% or 200%. It would be an overdrive. And for your kiddos, they would actually have more like 50% or less in terms of that. And that can either be due to, as I said, deletions of the whole region on the chromosome around set BP1, or maybe due to specific changes within just the one set BP1 gene. So for individuals that have deletions of set BP1, the other distinction I wanted to make is if they have other genes adjacent to set BP1 that are also deleted. So if it's what we call a multiple gene deletion, they may have additional features and things may be a little more challenging for them. And so the reason, again, that I make this distinction is that within the community, as your community grows, there may be some heterogeneity or there may be some differences between individuals. And if you compare, you know, if you compare one to each other, um, it's important to know what type of change, genetic change there is in set BP1 so that you'll know whether or not we're talking about apples and oranges or apples and tangerines, um, you know, or apples and potatoes, because um, there can be some differences, even though we're talking about the same gene. The final thing, uh, and I'll point this out a little bit, is some of the changes that we see in the set BP1 gene. We have a guess, and I think it's a pretty good guess about whether these are lead to what we call either the hyperactivity or the gain of function or the loss of function, but I don't think we know this absolutely perfectly yet. We haven't done actual experiments to determine the difference in all cases. Okay, next slide. So let me relatively quickly go through and explain what this is not again. Um, so what I've shown here is a figure from one of the papers that was describing Schinzel-Gideon syndrome, and I'm showing in that top part A, a schematic in terms of what that gene looks like. 
And what's very characteristic is you can see along the top of that bar um, some very specific what we call amino acids or positions where we tend to see the changes in that gene. So it's amino acids 868, 869, um, 870, or uh, 871. Those four very specific amino acids are located, and I won't go into the biochemistry, but it's, it's localization within exactly that place that's associated with Schinfeld-Gideon syndrome. Now, the reason I make the distinction is because there also are some cancers, in particular some blood cancers, in which we only see changes within that gene and it can lead to cancer. And individuals with Schinfeld-Gideon syndrome themselves, if they have those changes in those specific places, can also be associated with an increased risk of cancer. And the reason I'm making the distinction is because with the condition for this community I'm talking about today, I am not, let me underline, I am not talking about an increased cancer risk. And so even though it's early days, and I can't say this with 100% confidence, so far we have not seen an increased risk of cancer. And I think that's a, a really important distinction to make. Um, I put it down here simply because I think you'll see by comparing to your children, these are pictures of children with Schinfeld-Gideon syndrome, and to me, they don't have the facial characteristics, uh, for instance, of your children. So I hope you'll appreciate that I do think they're very distinct in different conditions. Next slide, Lindsay. So um, as we're talking about this, by contrast, um, for this community that we're talking about, the change we're talking about in set BP1 um, are changes where we are ramping down the function. So again, on that top line, what I'm showing you is that there are individuals who have deletions um, that have a missing part of the chromosome that includes set BP1, and the length of the different red bars is to represent that different individuals have different size deletions. And again, the larger the deletion is, it includes more genes, sometimes genes beyond set BP1. And in general, the bigger that deletion is, the more significant the impact is and the more challenges the individual can have. What I'm showing you in slide B in the middle there um, is that what you can see in contrast to the Schinfeld-Gideon syndrome, the changes that we're seeing uh, in the communities that your children represent really are much more spread out throughout the protein, throughout the gene. And so they're everywhere from, uh, again, I know it's a little bit hard to be able to understand this, but starting from the left, um, in that, that number 15 in the middle tells us it's at its 15th amino acid, so it's close to the beginning of the protein. It can be at 15 or 143 or 411 or 532 or 592, but you can see that it's spread out through many, many different locations, not simply at those small number of positions that I showed you within the last slide. And so many of these also I won't go into too much detail, um, but for the slide I showed you before, those were changes with just one amino acid or one protein building block to another. So they were relatively subtle and specific changes. Um, the changes, without going into too much detail here, when you see that uh, star or what's called FS, meaning frame shift, um, those are different types of DNA changes which tend to abolish or destroy one of the two copies of set BP1. And so again, those individuals generally we think of as having one functional copy of the protein. And just to show you by comparison, you can do a mental comparison to your own children. I've shown you some published figures of other children uh, or other the young people that have set BP1, and you can even see in some cases um, some of the change in their facial features over time. Next slide, Lindsay. Um, so to show you, this is again for the set BP1 loss of function or similar to your children. And I'm showing you this um, because there are some cases, there are more pu cases published than just the ones that I'm gonna show you about what was in Simon VIP. Um, and so showing on the left, this is about a dozen cases or so. And again, you're gonna have access to all of these slides right afterwards. The ones, the four on the bottom represent deletions. So they have uh, set BP1, the entirety of the gene, and in some cases, more genes that are deleted. And if you just look uh, by, for instance, the pluses and minuses on the right, 
or pluses rather, I should say, on the right mostly. Um, every individual, if you follow that line across, um, I'll just take the very bottom line for instance, um, there's a column for hyperactivity or ADHD, attention deficit, hyperactivity, uh, social difficulties, and if you read through all of those, you'll see that one person, the very sort of last line on this is a, a um, a four-year-old boy with a deletion that was new in that little boy, and his challenges were speech delay, motor delay, um, and some facial differences. So one of the things you'll notice if you look at those last four lines of the deletion and that very last column is that three out of those four individuals had seizures or at least abnormalities on their electroencephalogram or EEG. And in general, those individuals, there's, there's more, um, it's more frequent to have seizures with the individuals with the deletion. Now for the group I'm gonna tell you about from Simon's VIP, we didn't have individuals with the deletion. We had individuals who are more like the top part of that table. And as you'll see from looking at that top part of the table, we, we in general, the published cases have seizures less frequently, but there are some individuals who do have seizures. And so that's one of those things I want you to plant sort of at the back of your mind. Um, some of the other things that you're seeing pretty consistently, and, and again, just in the introductions and to each other, I think you could hear the same things. Very consistently, we're seeing problems with speech. Um, in these published cases, we're also seeing problems or challenges in terms of uh, motor delay, so age at first walking, age at um, being able to do other things in terms of moving the body. Um, that's what the motor part of it stands for. Um, but there are also some individuals who are having behavioral challenges. Um, so the things that people were talking about, um, the hyperactivity is one of the things, staying on task, staying focused is a challenge. Um, and social difficulties, certainly as we were hearing about earlier, are not present in everyone, but there are individuals who are having some social issues. Another take home message, which again, I'm gonna um, talk through a little bit, but you're not seeing a lot of other medical issues. So you're not seeing on this table a lot of uh, problems in terms of the way the body's working besides the brain. The brain tends to be the main place where we're gonna focus our attention. And, and that's gonna be true also of the cases um, or the information that we got from Simon's VIP. So let me just say one other thing and then I'll, I'll say a little bit about Simon's VIP. So there's one case uh, that, I'm, that I know a question came in specifically from the families. And so what I wanted to do was also highlight, um, there is one case that was reported in amino acid 873. And the reason I'm highlighting this is again, because there are some places, the other amino acids, just to remind you that were associated with Shinsulginian syndrome, were amino acids like 868, 69, 70, 71. Um, but there are some published cases that are very, very close but not exactly at the same position. So 873 is one that I'm showing you that has been published that's like that. And so far what it looks like for those individuals that are close, but not exactly in what we call the Degron affecting region, amino acids 868 to 871, is they seem to be, in terms of the way they're manifesting, more like what your children are manifesting. So I'm going to make it's a bit of a leap, but I think it's based on good information that you're, everyone that's represented in the cases I'm gonna be talking about are more like, um, not like Schinzel-Gideon syndrome, but like um, the ones that are outside that region in other places. So for some of you on the phone, I don't know what your mutations are. And so the reason I put this in to begin this discussion with is I wanted to make sure that you knew which part of this to focus on. And if anyone has any questions afterwards, uh, any of us who are medical professionals, I think, at least I speak for myself, and I think I speak for the group, we're, we're happy to take any questions you might have about that specifically. Okay, next slide, Lindsay. So uh, just to go over now what's in the group, um, and one of the things that I wanted to also let you know of is that for any of you who have participated or if you want to participate in the future, what we do is, again, we take away any identifying information so no one knows who you are. And the reason why we're talking about the results of the group as a whole is we don't want any one person to be singled out in this. And so um, it's a small group, but, but we're trying to protect all the children's identities.
So as you'll see for the first four of these, um, these are all outside of the region that I talked about, and they're all clearly um, disrupting one copy of the gene. Um, for, and I don't know if this person is on the call or not, but for the last one of these, again, it's eight, amino acid 874, which I think is outside the critical region, but it is this different type of genetic change where we're substituting one amino acid for another. And so the laboratory that reported this result originally said it was uncertain. They weren't 100% certain that that was the cause of the um, individual symptoms. But my best guess is that it probably is, but I understand why the laboratory said it was uncertain because the evidence behind it is a little bit weaker. Next slide. So going through this, um, and again, I tried to highlight the things first that were most consistent across all of the five children. Um, and again, remember, we're only going up to sort of middle of adolescence, so I still can't tell you about manifestations that might be present in older individuals, adults, and beyond. Um, but consistently, we were seeing across everyone, which is no surprise to this group, but problems in terms of delays uh, or in some of the older children where we could measure an IQ, intellectual disability. But one of the things I want to emphasize is everyone continued to progress. Everyone continued to advance. They continued to learn. They continued to make progress. Um, so all the things that I think the families you all are doing right now in terms of educational strategies, um, aggressive uh, sort of creative ways of learning how to communicate and learning how to read um, are very important to continue doing. Within this, in terms of impairment, certainly expressive language in particular was challenging and difficult. I do think the kids understand a lot more than they're able to communicate, um, but specifically expressive language was a challenge. Um, only one of the five individuals had autism in terms of having a diagnosis of autism, but I do think uh, it is possible to have some of the features of autism, but not have all of the features of autism. So in other words, not to have officially autism, um, but to have some of the features. So some of the things that we can see with children with autism about sensory issues, about clothing on tags, brushing teeth, brushing hair, some of those sensory issues are what I'm referring to. That's oftentimes some of the things that we see in autism. And your child may have that feature, but they may not have autism per se. Um, the other thing that was very, very common was problems attending or problems focusing. Um, and I think Dr. Sid's going to be speaking a little bit more about this, about treatments for this, but very, very common within this condition. Next slide. So, um, and you can go to the next slide, Lindsay. So now I'm going to focus on the medical issues that we saw, so things affecting the other parts of the body. Um, and again, one of the things that uh, I think the take-home message from this, if you're taking notes or trying to think yourself about where to focus, is the good news to me is there really was not a lot, uh, or at least there was not a lot outside of what we see with most other children um, generally or children uh, with neurodevelopmental problems. So starting out from when uh, the children were babies, um, we saw a little bit of things when they were newborns. And I put these in the slides, not so much for you as families, but for uh, families in the futures who might be diagnosing younger children. Um, but there was a little bit of breathing problems, a little bit of, if you remember, children that were a little bit yellow when they were newborns and may have required some light to get rid of the, uh, the bilirubin, but they did fine with all of that. Next slide. In terms of um, some of the things that people noticed very early on, um, and in some cases this week because parents were very much attuned to their child, maybe they'd already had children or been around babies, um, but issues in terms of muscle tone being low, problems feeding, problems breastfeeding, or being able to suck from the bottle right away were some of the first things you noticed. Next slide. Um, in terms of this, what the neurologists have also noted is what we call hypotonia or low muscle tone. That is that things were just not as strong. And many of the children have been going through physical therapy, which has been helpful in terms of improving that tone, making them stronger, making their core tone better. But that's something children, I think, continue to be to benefit from in terms of that. Um, one of the children was diagnosed with cerebral palsy, or CP. Uh, in retrospect, I think that that may have been uh, an inadvertent diagnosis or um, sort of the best diagnosis that we had at the time, but undoubtedly the, the correct, more correct diagnosis is really, as we now know, uh, the SET-BP1 diagnosis. Um, next slide. 
Um, in terms of vision, um, there have been some what I call minor problems with vision, um, needing to wear glasses uh, either because they had trouble seeing far away or astigmatism. Um, one of the points that I'll make though is that when children have challenges with their brains, uh, it's important that all their senses are working as well as possible. And so for instance, I do think it's helpful for children to have their eyes checked because if they aren't seeing the world clearly, it's harder for them to learn. It's harder for them to see, to be able to navigate and understand what's going on around them. And the same is also true for their hearing. So if your children haven't had their eyes checked, um, it is one of the things just to make sure there aren't any issues. It's, it's again, things very treatable, very remediable. Next slide. Um, in terms of the gastrointestinal or the belly issues, there are a lot of the things that we see pretty commonly with children with neurodevelopmental challenges. Um, so in the same way that muscle tone is low in the muscles, the arms, the legs, uh, the core body, muscles can also, muscle tone can also be lower in the intestinal system. And that sometimes can lead to problems either with constipation and or diarrhea. And so the same person can at some days be constipated and in some days it may feel like things are just running right through them. Um, the other place where we can see this is what we call gastroesophageal reflux or heartburn. Um, and that can actually be, um, you know, cannot be pleasant. And so any of these problems can lead to, you know, children just not being comfortable and sometimes they can't express it. They can't say why it is, um, but hopefully you're either gastroenterologist or pediatricians many times are comfortable uh, being able to treat this and they're very good medications at least for the reflux to be able to that make that feel more comfortable and for individuals with constipation also either dietary interventions or some medications that can help to keep things moving along next slide um, in terms of infections, what I would describe is that the children did not have any more than the usual types of infections. Um, they did have ear infections, but those, for those of you who have other children, know that that's not uncommon. That, that's not specific to set BP1. Um, but the one thing that I think was good was that for individuals who had repeated ear infections, um, they went ahead and had ear tubes placed. And I actually think that that's a good idea. Um, my magic rule is in a winter, if there are three or more ear infections, it's a good time to talk to an otolaryngologist or a, uh, a doctor that specializes in putting ear tubes in because we don't want the kids to feel like they're underwater in terms of hearing. We want them to be able to hear clearly so they can develop language and they can learn in school. Next slide. In terms of some other common things that we see in children, we had one child with asthma. Next slide. Um, and again, that's not specific. We had one child that had, um, there's a tube coming out of the heart and that child had aortic regurgitation. Um, in terms of severity, that's not necessarily a very severe problem, not something that necessarily needs treatment right away. Uh, what I really wanted to emphasize is there was not a lot of congenital heart disease, not problems in terms of heart beating, heart skipping beats. Um, so in general, I'd describe this as a relatively minor manifestation. Next slide. We did see one child that was um, had, was missing a kidney or had renal agenesis. Um, the good thing is that uh, most people have two kidneys, or at least if you have one working kidney, it ends up being just fine. But when we do see renal agenesis so such that a child has only one kidney, we do monitor just to make sure that one kidney continues to work well. Again, these are very, very small numbers, uh, but if your child has not had an ultrasound to be able to document and look and see that there are two kidneys, um, this is something you might want to share with your pediatrician as a possible manifestation with this, just to make sure we know that the kidneys are there, that there's no problem with water on the kidney um, or any other anatomical problems that might um, pose a future risk. And again, I don't think this is anything immediate, uh, but just as kind of a health inventory. Next slide. Um, again, remembering that these are boys that we were talking about in this series. We did see that it was relatively more frequent to have undescended testicles or testicles that may still be up in the abdomen or up in the belly. Um, we also saw one boy where the opening at the end of the penis was, uh, was placed a little bit differently. Um, the one thing that I'll say is that if the testicles don't come down on their own, it is important to have surgery to be able to kind of tack those testicles down in the scrotum 
um, because if they stay up in the belly, they actually can be associated with an increased risk of cancer in the future, increased risk of testicular cancer. So it's not something that has to be done when the children are little, but if any of you have boys that are older, and if the testes haven't come down by you know, the time the children are seven, eight, nine years old, um, or even perhaps a little bit younger, it would be good to have them tacked down, have them literally just um, sutured down into the, the scrotum. Next slide. Um, in terms of how the children are growing, in general, they were growing well, um, but especially early on, there may have been some trouble eating, and so that may have been associated with some slower weight gain. Next slide. Um, again, I want you to remember that the children that we're reporting on are relatively young, but there was one child with scoliosis or curvature of the spine, and it is one thing that as your children get into the teenage years and adolescence, uh, it would be good for your doctors to keep an eye on that because there isn't that oftentimes happens more frequently when they're teenagers. Next slide. So altogether, uh, as I said, the nice thing to me is that the, the, what we were seeing in terms of surgeries, we didn't see too much surgical burden, and we tended to see that once these things were done, they were taken care of. They didn't have to be repeated. And so the main surgeries that we saw were things like the tonsils, the adenoids, the ear tubes, and as I was alluding to before, um, the surgery that's called orchiopexy is how they um, keep the testicles down in the scrotum or the hypospadias repair being able to um, surgically fix the penis. Next slide. Um, in terms of special diets, uh, in part, I think people have been trying to see if there's anything that they could do that could help with some of the challenging behaviors. And so people have tried a variety of things, um, everything from a gluten-free diet, and there are lots of foods now available that are gluten-free or eliminating dairy from the diet, lactose-free. Um, and this is something, I don't think it's harmful if you try it. I, I don't think we have enough evidence yet to know whether or not any of these make a significant impact. But certainly we'd be interested just in terms of if you have tried things, you know, what's worked and, and I'm sure it's something good to share amongst the families. Next slide. Um, Dr. Sid is again going to talk a little bit more about medication specifically, um, but within the group there were a variety of medications that had been tried for ADHD. As I was alluding to, um, the good news is that at least in this small group, we didn't see that seizures were very frequent. It's not that I think that they can't happen, because as I showed you from some of the published cases, clearly they can, but at least it doesn't seem like it's a common problem. Next slide. Um, in terms of uh, what was working, and I think, again, because the tension, the, the distractibility was a big issue, um, I do think in terms of we did ask many of you what was working, what seemed to be most effective, and we do have some evidence um, in terms of a couple medications now that may be useful, and Dr. Sid is going to go into this a little bit more in detail. I don't think going into this there's anything about the genes set BP1 where we could have said for sure one medication or another was going to be more or less effective. It's a little bit of just trial and error, um, but I do think rather than everyone has to trying and erring, um, certainly sharing this type of information among the community can be very helpful. Next slide. Um, in terms of when children eventually were able to do things, again, in terms of expressive language, being able to speak, it's oftentimes been um, either one word or shorter sentences or simplified speech, um, but it is coming, it is developing, so definitely don't give up, keep working on that. Um, the other thing is that now with some additional technologies, I think it's been much more, um, we've had a lot more channels or a lot more ways for children to be able to work to express themselves. So if any of you are using things like communication devices or com assisted communication boards, whether they're electronic with the iPad or any that might be um, just charts, you know, sort of uh, on paper, um, cards, picture cards, flip pads, whatever you're using, um, these definitely have been helping in terms of the expressive language. Uh, in general, the other thing is um, individuals have been um, gaining a lot of practical day-to-day -day skills in terms of being able to be toilet trained, being able to have um, be more independent and take care of both themselves with hygiene, um, bathing, being able to help with other things. But again, it's taken time, uh, so be patient. But as you're focusing the educational plans both at school and reinforcing them at home, certainly work on some of those day-to-day -day activities and, and helping the children to be as independent as they can be. Next slide. 
So in terms of this, um, you know, we've given you all the information we have, but clearly there are still a lot of unanswered questions. And part of what we like being able to talk with the families about are what are the important questions to you that remain unanswered? Um, the ones that I could think about and put these down um, were just, again, as I said, are there ways that we can teach the children better, either strategies, especially for reading, strategies from communication, um, things that work in terms of, again, very practical day-to-day -day things that can be helpful. Um, and if we need to use medications, what medications seem to be most effective, both in the short and the long term. Um, some of the sensory issues, um, besides just avoiding them, um, there can be ways of being able to sensitize individuals, in other words, letting, exposing them little bits at a time until they can um, feel comfortable with some of those sensory issues. And those are especially important when it comes to things like brushing teeth, um, just in terms of dental hygiene. So there may be some strategies that you've thought about um, that can you, you can share with each other. So next slide, Lindsay. So just in summary, uh, again, most of the issues that we were seeing were associated around neurodevelopmental issues. Um, I want to point out that we did not see any regression or individuals going backwards or losing skills. Sometimes if the skills aren't firmly grounded, they may not stick. Um, and I don't mean that by regression, but when kids really, really have mastered something, um, completely losing that. We have not seen that. Again, in this small group, we didn't see any seizures, although they can be seen. And importantly, either in any of the published series or in anything we saw, we didn't see any cancer associated. Again, the kiddos are still young, but we haven't seen that yet. So let me just quickly go through the next couple slides because people often ask about this. Um, there are remarkable advances that are being made in terms of gene therapy and gene editing. Um, the very short story that I'll say right now is that this is looking promising uh, as a general strategy, but we're not there yet in terms of doing it for anything like step BP1 or similar conditions. I'm not saying it won't ever be possible, but right now it's not something in the short term we can depend on. So it's important for us to keep doing the day-to-day -day practical things you're already doing. Next slide. The idea is that there's new technology that's being developed to be able to literally uh, take and correct one single letter in the alphabet, um, which is what really your kids all have, is one single letter that might be changed. Um, it is important that this be tested out very rigorously and that it's very safe because in prior attempts to use gene therapy in people, there have been places besides the target where we were trying to change the genes um, that have resulted in what we call off-target effects, which have even led to cancer or deaths in those individuals. So we want to make sure this field is developed really safely before we start trying it um, in our patients. Next slide. So in terms of being able to advance this, and uh, I think Haley had the exact right idea, we are trying to make this easier for you all and make it easier for researchers to help you. And so with Simon CIP, what we've been doing is any of the data that you're putting in, we're trying to minimize the burden for you all so that as you're putting this data, you can participate effectively in hopefully dozens of studies. That is that researchers who are interested in this can come to Simon's VIP and be able to get your information and learn from you without you having to answer the same questions over and over again. And so this information is available uh, de-identified, but to any researcher around the world who might want to be able to study set BP1. And um, we hope this continues to grow over time. For those of you who are, have already participated, we actually come back to you on an annual basis to see how your kids are doing. Um, and as we're doing this, we also, if anyone deposits anything like blood cells or skin cells uh, in Simon CIP, these can also be available to any of the researchers so you don't have to get cells taken multiple times. Next slide. Um, so as we're doing this, uh, we obviously want to help that hope that more people get the right diagnosis and that this can um, make the group larger over time. Um, as I said, one of my sayings is the care until the cure. So we want to make sure that before we have a definitive way of being able to treat this condition, we continue to support your kids and learn from each other as we're doing it. And as Haley had said, um, be able to help the research community by um, accelerating and catalyzing things like the development of cell lines in mice. Um, and if we can at Simon's VIP, also learn things from other conditions that are applicable to set BP1, be able to share those with you as well. Next slide. So one effort that we have at the, uh, at the Simons Foundation to increase the size of the set BP1 community is a program that's called SPARK for Autism. Um, SPARK stands for Simons Foundation Powering Autism Research for Knowledge. And if any of you are in communities or have um, 
for instance, at your children's school or maybe some of their therapy programs, individuals who couldn't get access to the exome sequencing that made the diagnosis for your child. Uh, Spark for Autism is a study of individuals with autism, so they have to have autism, but if they do have autism, they can register and they can be mailed a kit to their home where we can collect saliva or spit to be able to do that exome sequencing to make the diagnosis. It may not be that they have set BP1 as a diagnosis, but if they have any genetic um, cause of autism that we recognize, they have the opportunity to get that information returned to them through the study, and it costs them nothing. Um, so that, that's one of the things that we hope will have many individuals with set BP1 diagnosed in the United States that'll help grow your community so that we can learn more faster. Okay, next slide, Lindsay. I'm gonna um, just want to acknowledge uh, there are many people that work behind the scenes. So you've met online Lindsay and Jennifer today, um, but there are a lot of fantastic people who help make this happen and just want to acknowledge them. Okay, so I think we've got a couple minutes for questions here. So if anyone, Lindsay, I haven't been watching, but if anyone's uh, um, put in questions through the chat or if anyone wants to um, just go ahead and ask them, then I'll be glad to take questions. Okay, um, I had one question come up through the chat during the presentation, um, and that was just how are the families able to find out the size of the deletion that their child has? Okay, so for anyone, and I'm glad to do this offline, um, but you can either talk to your geneticist or whatever doctor ordered your test. If you had any of the changes, so I should have shown some changes way back at the beginning. Um, so if your changes were any of those ones that were set BP1 and then they showed a string of letters and numbers after them, um, those are changes that only affect set BP1. It's not a deletion and it doesn't include a larger size. Um, and you don't have to worry about the size. It acts effectively all the same in terms of just uh, eliminating one copy of set BP1. If you had a change from a test that was probably a chromosome microarray, it would say that you had a change that had a deletion. And I know it's scabbly book in those reports to read, but it actually tells you exactly the coordinates of what we call them base pairs, but what region of the chromosome is missing and how big it is. And again, um, I'm glad to go over it with you on an individual basis or your genetics doctor or neurologist or developmental pediatrician can go over it with you. Um, but it's hard for me to know without seeing the specifics. So we, I'll be glad to take that offline and help anyone who needs help getting oriented. Any other questions? I think I got one. I'm Jean-Francois. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you have only five child for the um, the study you've made, yes. but you're still yes. looking for to to have uh, more people. Yes. You have said BP one. You want to have more than five to to. You still searching a uh, child to to fill up the study you made is that correct yes. yes so at this point we only have you're absolutely correct we only have five people in set bp1 um, we actually don't have a maximum number of people we could take so if there were through the community if you know about 500 more people i don't think we do but if you did we could take 500 more people and be able to make this a more powerful resource for you and for any of the researchers studying it. So we have not capped it at five people, but so far it's only five people who have signed up and who have filled out all this information that I showed you today. And these five people, it's um, maybe people that we all know all together. It's not a whole study that you've made five years ago or something like that. It's, it's with the study you've made with with VIP Simon and uh, the work I do to publish it to to comment je peux dire pour le So I'm not sure if I entirely understood that, but yes, you're right that it's it's only five so far. They are mostly recently um, reporting this information, so I do think it's pretty current and up to date in terms of that. Um, in terms of the community, we're very anxious to make sure the community knows about this. Uh, on the other hand, we realize and appreciate that there are researchers, and I'm speaking as for Simon's VIP, 
uh, what we're trying to do is get this available to the researchers who are studying and focused on SETBP1 so that if, for instance, they want to be able to publish on large numbers of patients with SETBP1 and, and be able to have a very comprehensive um, set, that they can take this information from Simon CIP and combine it with perhaps other cases in the literature or other cases that they've established. Um, so we're not trying to, you know, be the ones studying this ourselves. What we're trying to do at Simon CIP is mostly to enable the researchers who want to study, make it easier for you and make it easier for them. We kind of, uh, kind of like matchmakers, you know, we're trying to help put people together but minimize the burden on the families. Um, and if that doesn't happen just naturally on its own, we will figure out a way to get the information out to the community, but, but we're hoping that folks that are interested specifically in SETBP1, and you'll hear from Dr. Sid being one of those, and um, you know other people like Isabel um, around the world who are interested in this, we're trying to just make it easier for them to do their job. Okay, so maybe we have, this, uh, yeah. Oh, and this is Jennifer. I just wanted to add a little bit more information. Um, so we have uh, five people that have reached a certain point of giving like a, a richer amount of information for us to return to you. We do have um, a total of 12 families who have at least gone in and entered their initial registration information. And so um, as we go uh, through the process over time, you'll have some families that have just started and some families that have gotten maybe midway through providing some information and some families that have provided all the information we need. So, um, so getting that message back to the family group about you know, that the finding out from the study coordination team what else they need to complete. Um, we do have other families that are already kind of in the pipeline to, to be providing that information. Okay, so it's just a question. It's just because you don't have time to put their, uh, their um, in, the, in this study. It's just because they, they will be in, uh, in further months, it will be done. You have more family. And in further months, it will be done. But now you don't have time to put them in the five case we talked today. Is that correct? Actually, it's it's um it we've provided back to you all the information that we we currently have from families. But maybe um, there are a few other families who have signed up, but they haven't done their consent form, or they've okay. signed up, but they haven't sent us their clinical lab report so that we can verify that they're kind of in the right group. Um, and then they haven't been, you know, so, so there's a sequence of events that happen um, and different families are in a different stage. Um, okay, and so it's, it's, you know, they might, they might be busy and that, you know, they um, don't have time right now, but maybe in a month or two, they'll, they'll have had time to complete more information for us. That's great. I understand that one. Okay. Okay. It's a little bit hard from because my English is not, is not perfect. Okay. But, uh, yeah. I Sorry think about that. Uh, you're able to understand what I tried to say. Okay. Okay. Thanks a lot. I, hello, this is Brian Hobson. So, kind of along the, the lines of, of, of that question, I'm just curious at, at what point clinically, uh, you know, how, how, how many children do you need to have in the study clinically before you feel like the results are statistically relevant? So, Brian, this is Wendy. Um, you know, I think it's more is always better. Um, and the reason I say that is because, in part, what I think is one of the bigger challenges is that everyone is not the same, um, for sure, within this condition. And I do think that in terms of different life stages, um, the more we know, especially about older children, the more it helps the younger children. So what I would say is there's no upper limit um, for conditions that are rare you know, ideally we like to have hundreds and, and we're not there yet in terms of that. And, and it's largely just because it's a rare condition and because not enough people have access to the testing that identifies that they have the condition. So what we're committed to doing is at least support the community as large as it can get um, and be able to, like I said, help sure. make that information back. So don't worry about, you know, that we've got too much and that we don't need more information. Right now, I think we need all the information we can get. Yeah, I, I was more asking about the floor, though. You know, at what, at what point uh, is the, the minimum number where you where you really feel like the, that your your findings are, uh, you know, concrete? I mean, I think right. I think the findings are pretty concrete in terms of saying for sure that if you have set BP one, 
um, there are going to be challenges in terms of development and how the brain's functioning. Um, I think there are low frequency events for other things, and I don't know that we've hit we, we have enough to see all the low frequency events because in many just other conditions that are like this, we might have something that only happens to 10% of children. And, you know, if we only have five kids or even 20 kids, um, you know, we might miss something that only happens 10% of the time or something that hasn't hit, doesn't hit until people are 25 years old. Um, but I do feel like statistically, not just from what I showed you today with the individuals in VIP, but also from the published cases, that this is going to be associated with, you know, educational challenges, things coming more slowly. Um, but I, I, and I can't say for sure, like I said, that we know what's going to happen when people are 25. But, you know, I feel fairly comfortable about the neurological things we're seeing so far. So, and if, if there are other questions, I'll let other folks go. I have a few things popping up in my head. Um, I have two questions that came up in chat. Um, so the, the first is what is needed in terms of time and money to advance a potential therapy um, to the clinic? So I'll just say very briefly, because this is a big talk, um, but one of the things we do work on is trying to also get, um, whether it's researchers in universities or researchers in pharmaceutical companies, but anyone to think about how to work on set BP1 and be able to accelerate things. Um, I will say that one of the things is that when I try and get pharmaceutical companies interested in this, um, they're very much driven by they want to make sure there's if they spend a lot of money, you know, maybe even millions of dollars developing a drug, they want to make sure there's someone who can use that drug. So their magic number oftentimes is 100. If they have 100 individuals out there, then that's something that they'll pay more attention to. And so that's part of why I'm trying to drive this in terms of knowing what the numbers are out there and making sure we can make a convincing story of that. We also, at the Simons Foundation, as part of what we do, we actually fund researchers. So in addition to aggregating things like this, we actually give grants for people to work on conditions like this. So if any of you are working with or know any of your doctors or researchers, definitely spread the word. You know, there are ways to put in applications to do this. And, and it's not easy. This takes, you know, this type of research often takes many, many years or decades um, before it gets to a treatment. Uh, but I do think those two things, and as Haley had said originally, doing things like having mouse models available, cell lines available, those are all things that definitely accelerate the research. Uh, and then the second question, question, yeah, um, is what is the hypothesis as to why loss of function of the set BP1 gene causes most of the symptoms present with the disorder? So I think um, this particular gene is probably what we call dosage sensitive. That is, it, it matters to the brain especially to have enough of this protein to do its job and that if you have, you know, even half the amount, that's not enough to do what the brain needs to do in terms of its day-to-day -day function. Um, so in, in other words, in thinking about eventually how we fix this, I do think that for most of the, the families that are on the line today, it's going to be restoring that function, getting it back closer to 100% of what it is, but importantly, not going overboard, because I think when you go too much on this, potentially there's an increased risk of cancer. So it's going to be finding that right balance to get it just back close to 100%, but not 200%. So are, when, when you talk about restoring function uh, of the gene, are, are, are you now talking about medication? Uh, you're talking about some sort of medical intervention, correct? So it could come in the form of a medicine, like a pill you would take. It might come, as I alluded to briefly, you know, in terms of gene therapy or having some way of either administering more of the protein or fixing the gene primarily. Um, there are, I won't go into a huge amount of detail, but it could be directed immediately on set BP1, or there are also ways in which it might be directed around things that work around or with set BP1, just sort of generically. Um, and part of this is going to be dependent on, like I said, how robustly gene therapy ends up being, how robust it is with other technologies to be able to fix this. So part of this is, at least in my opinion, is to you know, make sure your kids are advancing and as healthy as possible, and then to facilitate for researchers to figure out these strategies so that when they are available, your kids are poised and ready to go. So that's a future state uh, kind of conversation, correct? I mean, there's not a, 
a gene therapy today that you would recommend or, or that, uh, you know, uh, might be worth trying? Correct. So, so I absolutely do not think there's anything safe in terms of gene therapy for SETBP1 right now. Um, I think in terms of timeline for that, we're probably talking at least five years into the future and perhaps longer um, in terms of as that science is maturing and developing. And I think what we're going to be watching for the community here is seeing how that develops for other conditions, other neurological diseases, and being able to learn from that. So when it is mature, when it's safe, when it's effective, um, then you're sort of in line, ready to go. But I don't. I, I think based on a number of factors, there's some safety issues that I think we really need to make sure it is safe for the kids. Um, and in the meantime, there's a lot of potential for them to grow, especially using some of the technologies that are available and will be available in the future to support them. Um, and so I think that's personally what I look for is being able to think about how do we, again, take most advantage of the way that their brains do work and how they are able to learn and make sure that we can, you know, treat the symptoms that they're having so that they can just be happy kids and, you know, grow up healthy and be able to be ready when other treatments that uh, are developed are, are proven to be effective and safe. And in general, is there, is there an age where gene therapy starts to become less effective? Um, it's you know, very, very good. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. It's a, no, it's a very, very good question. And one of the things that's a nuance on what Haley was talking about is there are ways of actually setting up mouse models to answer directly that question, to decide, you know, is there an optimal age of gene therapy? And the bottom line is that those experiments haven't been done yet for at SETBP, um, and, but I think they do need to be done before we would think about doing gene therapy in the kids because your question is absolutely right on target. You know, maybe this isn't going to be effective in people that are 30 years old, but maybe it's effective in people that are 13 or three. Um, so we need to figure that out. Thank, thank you. <laughs> we're, just, we're just firing away. I appreciate the, appreciate the okay. information. 